Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host, and we have another great show for you this evening. We have Caroline Corey, Dave Altman, and Dave Mason, or David, called David Altman or David Mason. Anyway, uh, Caroline is going to be on for the first hour, and the two Davids are coming on in the second hour. It may join us just a little bit early. So right now, I would like to play a uh, the trailer for what we're going to be talking about uh, this evening, this uh, great movie. Here we what has made mankind is an insatiable curiosity. Insatiable. What is that? Nobody knows. The phenomenon. Nobody's ever done this as far as I know. It's a huge amount of work, a huge amount of data and equipment. That has never been done. Whatever this is, is more complex than we could ever imagine. This is a first in the field of ufology. The variety of devices we're bringing as a team to study the phenomenon covered an entire spectrum of different technologies in real time. That moment shook me to the core because I knew my life was about to change again. I think we're going to have like a couple of really, really good spots. When I hear that you've assembled a team of top scientists using state-of-the-art equipment, I say to myself, it's about time. This is an unidentified, unclassified new phenomenon. Wow. Tic Tacs. Maybe Tic Tacs. Maybe. Caught on our cameras. Yep. That's incredible. Crazy. It isn't crazy, it's crazy. It's crazy. We can go from body heat to very cold, like about minus 62 Celsius or minus 80 Fahrenheit. Wow. We will be transmitting data up to 800 terahertz in frequency. Our highest technology is up around 500 gigahertz. I can't tell you how much I'm looking forward to seeing what you've uncovered. We're triangulating and converging at two points, the same object. It's, it's, gone. it's gone. It's gone. gone. It's friggin' gone. That's up over Catalina. We need you up here. We could be heading towards the biggest see I told you so in history. That's what we need, the smoking gun that'll clinch it, that once and for all will settle the debate. No ifs, ands, or buts. And in the process, rewrite all of human history. Is this the wormhole? It's insane. Well, I thought the movie was Tear in the Sky, but it's Tear in the Sky. Um, so we'll, we're going to be talking with Caroline in just a minute. Before, though, I, I wanted to talk quickly about my blog. I wrote the blog this week. And what I decided to do, now I may lose some listeners, I realize that, and I may uh, get some people a little bit upset. But uh, the title of the blog that I wrote is called The Bob Lazar Condundrum, Muddying the UFO Waters. And what I decided to do is uh, I've had these documents that pretty much if anyone really takes the time to read through them, they'll understand that uh, Bob Lazar um, is someone that has told a really good story. That's, that's what it is. And I, I know you, George Knapp, stands behind him, Jeremy Corbell and others. But I will tell you that if you take the time and you read through all the documents, the blog is on my website, podcastufo.com. Uh, if you take your time and go through all the documents, you will understand. Uh, people are writing me that said, oh, I followed Bob Lazar forever. Thank you for posting this. Now I know not to any longer. So, uh, but anyway, uh, take, take, uh, take a look over at podcastufo.com. I will put the uh the link in the youtube uh you will be able to link to that and and see that so uh on to more positive things uh, so our guest she has been on before and i'm excited to have her back caroline welcome to the show hey martin thanks for having me uh, i like your background <laughs> <That's great. laughs> i'll throw up so, my movie <laughs> yes right so uh caroline uh what inspired you first of all to 
I, I know you've done some movies before and you've done really well, won awards and all that. And uh, this is uh, this is quite a concept. How did you come up with this? Well, I don't know if you've seen my other movies, but I try yes. to, yeah, I, I, I try to take a paranormal subject and try to validate it in some way, make it more normal. And so the way to do that is to bring science, to bring whatever science we have that could validate the, the topic. And so, um, so I thought, uh, how do we do this in ufology, you know, because I've had my personal sightings and my personal experiences since I was a child. So I know this phenomenon is real. I know hundreds of people, um, you know, through my career uh, who have had, you know, all sorts of experiences and sightings. So that wasn't the issue. It was more, how do we validate this, you know, stop making it as if it was something weird or fringe or pseudoscience. So, so normally I would um, uh, go out and look for scientists who are open to the idea and see, okay, well, how would they go about it? And so in my research, another thing as a filmmaker, uh, when you have an idea, the first thing you do is uh, investigate who else has done a film like this, uh, you know, what what have they learned? What can I learn from that? And I was kind of shocked to see that no one has done an actual scientific investigation from scratch, like in real time, not scientific analysis of footage that's out there. And so mm -hmm. when I realized that it has never been done before, I was even more convinced. I was like, I have to do this, no matter what the cost is, we need that sort of um, angle and uh, an investigation. And that's how I ended up making the film. Yes, and speaking of equipment, um, I'm gonna have Dave, uh, David Mason on in the second hour and talk to him more about that. But wow, I was kind of blown away with the type of equipment that you had in those three different locations. Uh, specifically out in Catalina, I believe that's where, was that where the majority of the equipment was? No, actually, originally that was the idea. We were going to be mostly stationed in Catalina because it was mm -hmm. tied to the story. Because again, uh, I first stumbled on Kevin Day, who is the radar operator on the USS Nimitz, uh, USS mm -hmm. Princeton 2004. And so when he told me his story, I was very touched. And he actually, in the film, I had told more about about that story than I think anywhere else. I haven't seen him say certain things. So because of that story, it kind of brought me back to where it all started, if you will. And then after that, other uh, Navy ships as well um, reported swarms of drones around the ship and similar events uh, later in 2014, 15. So I thought, if we're going to go anywhere, let's go back to the same area where, um, you know, that whole thing started. And so originally we, we said, well, we're going to put all the equipment on Catalina because that's the hot spot. But when we realized from a filmmaking point of view <laughs> what that was going to take, you know, I don't know if you've been to Catalina, but there are no cars, there are no trucks. Yeah. That makes it's it very not, difficult. Oh my yes. God, there's like golf carts. And we had, <laughs> I was like, how do you do this? Huge amount yeah. of equipment. So we reversed it because we wanted to triangulate. So we wanted three locations. So we said, let's put most of the equipment on the shore side, on the Laguna yes. side, and then do the satellite team on Catalina. So that's kind of how we ended up uh, doing yeah. it. Yeah. Well, that obviously makes makes sense. And yeah, um, so I, you know, Kevin Day, you just mentioned Kevin Day, and I believe I was the first one to interview him for like a podcast. And, uh, and he's been on several times, maybe four or five times since. But um, I, I as well, I was just talking about that today. I had not heard him say certain things before. Uh, okay. Specifically, um, you know, I, I realize how, you know, emotional he gets uh, when talking about this and to me that you know that's a very authentic emotion when you're talking about something that really changed your life but i didn't realize that what i heard him say 
for the first time is that he felt as though it ended his career. And I never heard him say that before. Exactly. That's what I what I meant when I interviewed him. I heard him say certain things uh, with in our movie that I hadn't heard before. That's why I was blown away. I was so tired. Originally, I wasn't even going to cover that story because I thought, oh, my God, by now, everybody in ufology knows the story, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, when he started mentioning these things and also I'm not sure if you also mentioned about how they confiscated all the, the, the data from him and, um, and that That's whole right. piece, that was also not mentioned. I don't think it was. And so that's the reason why I was like, wait, that story was, hasn't been told this way. This is extremely powerful. And that's the reason why I decided not only to tell the story again, but to start with the story. And sure enough, I mean, you saw the film. Eventually, we end up finding things that are very similar to those Tic Tacs that he found. So it, it was interesting how it kind of came full circle with that story. I, I thought it was really incredible coincidence. Right. I did. I remember speaking, I believe, with Gary Voorhees about the data bricks that were taken off the ship. But that's all. And I had never heard about uh, I believe Kevin Day said that there was erased data or something, something yes. along those lines, which is uh, which is fascinating. Never heard him say that either. So exactly, exactly. That's why. So even the people who think they saw the you know the, the story, you know, there's definitely these these elements that are in this film, and just watching him, you know, tell you know tell these details, it's incredibly. Uh, powerful, I thought. So, yes. yeah. And then when they said, both of them said the data was erased, the tapes were erased. Even, even Gary said, even blank tapes were erased. That's so cool. that's kind of crazy. It makes you think what's going on here, you know? Right. Oh, I should, I should tell the listeners that we have Matthew Shadagas and we have uh, Gary Voorhees and Kevin Knuth has come. They're all coming uh, on together on August 16th, right here on this show. Right. So that should be interesting. All, all people that have been on before, but I'm having them all three together. And uh, I'm sure we'll be bringing up uh, their adventure. So as far as you choosing the locations, that uh, those are quite the pads, <laughs> quite the houses that uh, these places were shot in. And um, just the way the housing market is and everything, it's so hard to... I hear all these people that are just trying to find a place to live, never mind a, a place to use for a week or two, whatever it was that you used. So how did you have someone scouting for you? How did you figure out how to find these places? Yeah, when we were in pre-production, we were doing a location scouting and we'd stumble on this house uh, because obviously we wanted the vantage point, you know, we wanted a rooftop. And um, yeah. and so, so that house was one among others uh, that were available. And it ended up, again, all the coincidences that happened during this filming uh, were really fascinating. So that house ended up, he, the, the owner ended up being a friend of uh, the cameraman that we were going to use. <laughs> uh -huh. and, yeah, yeah, the production. Yeah. And so it was so kind of like it, it was the kind of a package deal that we ended up having so so lucky because as you saw uh it, it looked beautiful and for, of course i'm a filmmaker uh i want you know as much as possible have the production value or if possible you know to make it as cinematic as possible especially these these genre you know you don't see that so often so i try, I try to bring a little bit of that when i can and uh, it looked incredible. And of course, you know, the vantage point, everything was just amazing. So it was just, we were just lucky. Wow. And, and Catalina Island, how did you find the place there? Yeah, that was another nightmare because also we chose to film. I mean, it was like we had so many crazy things happen. Uh, so it was in the middle of the summer. So high season, very, very expensive no place to to rent anywhere um and we ended up 
literally grabbing the last hotel rooms <laughs> that were oh. yeah 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 that were available and then we talked to the um hotel uh you know management we told them what we were doing and uh we they let us use the rooftops because that was the idea we were looking for a place that had a rooftop so we could have those two vantage points you know communicating with each other so we actually had a triangulation right did you or was that just part of the time no not always no 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 i mean it, it's incredible that we even had one or two i mean you have to realize martin you know I mean, you see the footage that's out there. You see what people are putting out. There's incredible stuff. But the odds of capturing one object from two different angles or across multiple devices and correlating with other, I mean, just that is incredibly lucky, you know. Mm -hmm. So so the triangulation we were hoping, I mean, that was the idea behind splitting the teams, um, we were hoping to have triangulation all the time, <laughs> but uh, it was only maybe once, you know. Um, but um, but what, what did happen all the time, only from uh, the data that is in the film, because there's, t there's hundreds of hours of data that scientists are still going through that we haven't even gone through. I just picked the three or four most compelling cases and put them in the film. So those mm -hmm. cases, there were always some sort of correlation with other devices, other angles, something. So it was never just this one off thing because that defeats the purpose of what we were trying to do. One of the things uh, I, I really liked about the film is right off the bat, you were talking to, this is something that I'm really into. I'm really getting into right now is talking to the average Joe on the street. Hey, uh, have you ever seen a UFO? And then hearing, you know, people's responses. And I love those stories. And you started out uh, doing that. Uh, so I, I just wanted to ask you, did you have a sign out there? I mean, I've seen people that have done, like James Fox had a sign um, out when he was down in Brazil. Uh, did you have a sign that said, if you had a UFO sighting, you know, call or anything <laughs> like How did you get those people? No, actually, Dave Altman, too, was on that side trying to help out. So we would just stop random people. And, and just so ask had, them? Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we had our cameraman. We were ready to film. So, you know, in terms of camera lighting angle and all that stuff. Um, and so we would just random people would just grab them. and But we had specific questions. Um, you know, that because w for me to edit this together and make it make sense, uh, we needed to have some sort of consistency. So I told them to answer specific questions. Um, I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so so we would just grab somebody on the street and say, hey, you know, we're doing doing documentary and on UFOs. Can we ask you a couple questions? And that's kind of how. Uh, and most people, as you saw, they're very open. We have, yeah. I, I mean, you can imagine we had everything the whole ring you know from i don't believe in ufos to crazy crazy stories you know from the bible you know so, oh, yeah. so you know yeah, yeah i had to pick and choose but to make it you know relevant and and consistent uh enough also with the footage that we had so um mm -hmm. so i think that i love doing those those things i think in every film i've done i have that <laughs> oh wow yeah i love it too so i would say that when you stop a random person on the street, you're going to get, it seems like over 70% of the people seem to either have had a sighting or have known someone that had a sighting and can talk about it. Would you, do you think that's sort of accurate or do you think it's less than that? What do you think? Yes, absolutely. Most people, I would say, even if they hadn't seen one themselves, they would report, they would say, well, my friend told me or something. There's always someone uh, that they know, you know, who had had a sighting. But something that's usually like 99% of the time that we get is, do you believe we're the only ones out there? You know, do you believe that there are other yeah. civilizations? Pretty much everyone by now is saying, of course, we're not the only ones. Yeah. So, um, yeah, definitely. It's refreshing. Right. It's fun. Yes. And I know that you were on quite a while ago, several years ago on this show. But if could you remind me, you mentioned when you first came on that you had personal sightings. Um, can you talk about that, at least one of them? 
Yeah, for sure. So, so the sighting, UFO sightings, right? Not yes, yeah, so that's what uh, I mean. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So actually, my favorite one happened quite recently. Like uh, I think it was just before the filming. You know, so a couple of years ago, uh, oh. I was at my house and it was nighttime, and I just felt the urge to just go outside. It was uh, around nine thirty. And I look up and I see these three balls of light. They're bouncing off of each other. And my first reaction was, this is weird because they weren't very bright. They weren't very far, you know. So my first reaction is like, oh, you know, it's nothing. It's searchlights because it was, I remember it was Labor Day. So I mm. thought, yeah, dismiss it. And I was like, no, wait, <laughs> searchlights aren't going to do that. Searchlights will do this, you know. And so, mm -hmm. so then I went to get my camera. Of course, it's the, the battery's out, of course. So I, was, I was like, okay, well, if you are what you are, like maybe I can see something. I don't know if they hear or whatever. But the point being, those two, those three balls of light split into four, then six, then eight. And of course, wow. we've heard stories like this before. We've seen mm -hmm. footage like this before. So now I'm even more convinced. Uh, but I'm still questioning, how come they're not so bright? How come they're this? How come they're not so far? You know, so then I started to walk and I said, OK, well, you know, if there's any sort of, a, you know, intelligence behind it. So I, I went outside my house and I started walking like half a mile in one direction. And these lights are literally like hovering right above me this way. And then wow. I walk in another direction and they do the same thing. So obviously there was something happening there. That event totally blew my mind, blew my mind. And speaking of um, other people, uh, there was this woman um, that she was walking her dog, right? Like a neighbor. And then I said, hey, do you see these lights up there? And then she looks up and she goes, yeah, that's interesting. She looks like interesting. And then she goes about walking her dog like nothing happened. <laughs> yeah. And then I said, yeah. Would you, what do you think this is? Like, you know, it was like, I don't know. Is You know, like she was like totally not even wanting to go there. So I just thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, you know, people all react differently. You yeah. Know? And yeah, I mean, I, I had a friend that had one of the most amazing sightings I've ever seen. And he said he could care less like that. Yeah. It, it, so everyone reacts differently yeah. to, to whatever it is. And to me, I, I wouldn't be able to, you know, turn away from it, you know? So it's, uh, it's, it, it is really interesting. And at any time, were you afraid at all when this thing was, it seemed like it was following you maybe? It was following me. And uh, like I said, I wanted to see if there was intelligence behind it, because even remember in the USS Nimitz uh, event, you know, Commander Fravor even mentioned how when he was chasing this tic tac, like as if it knew where he was going. Uh, do you remember that? Mm -hmm. That him yeah. mentioned that. So I was kind of like that. I was like, is there intelligence behind it? Like, would do they know like what I'm expecting or something like that? And so I wasn't afraid at all. I, I really uh -huh. wasn't. Yeah, I, it, it didn't really occur to me that this is something, you know, uh, I was just kind of into it, you know. I didn't feel any sort of danger or anything. There was a there's a story of, a, of, of, of something that goes along with this where this guy was flashing a light at, at a UFO and it was flashing, matching what he was doing. And he did like an experiment where he was thinking he was thinking of flashing and it flashed. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I heard of something like that. That's what's, I love that kind of stuff because it's like, what's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know? So, and even like if people don't want to think that there's intelligence or the aliens can hear you or it's telepathic communication. So what is it? Do, do you just make it up and you make it happen yourself, which is even more crazy. <laughs> right. right. You know, so. I had uh, last week I had Mario Woods on and I've gotten a lot of a uh, lot of really positive uh, feedback from his show. Um, he was in the military back in the 1970s and he was at a, a missile base uh, where there were nuclear warheads and he had quite an encounter. Um, and I have never heard this before. And I'm going to tell it to you and see if you ever heard anything like this. It was, 
he was being communicated with basically, I forget what, what the word, the phrase was that was over and over again, something like nothing to worry about or don't worry or something like that. But he said it was this, this is really bizarre, but he said it was as if it was coming through the fluids of his body, like when you're underwater and talking. Mm, I have never heard anything like that. I haven't heard anything like that. But you know, of course, in my previous work. Oh, I'm sorry. Someone just corrected me. So it just popped up. Fear not. It was fear oh, not. Yeah. Yes. Pardon me. Yeah. Go right ahead. Sorry about that. Go yeah, ahead. I haven't heard this story, but you know, in my previous work, I've done experiments. I'm not the only one either. There are many experiments. Uh, Lynn McTaggart, for example, uh, Schwartz, Dr. Schwartz at the University of Arizona and uh, in Stanford, they have conducted all sorts of experiments like that, where uh, you would think there's, there's tons of examples on this, where you would think um something and then a, a plant reacts to your thought um you know things like that all sorts of you know experiments done scientifically under laboratory condition control conditions so there's definitely something there i'm a big believer because i've had way too many experiences uh that mm -hmm. that you know prove that there is something there to me it's some sort of entanglement you know the science we don't have the science yet but the fact that uh, we can measure it over and over, then there is something going on there. Yeah, I mean, there's so many ways, you know, the vibrational and um, it seems like everything can somehow be connected. It's it's really, um, you know, really quite amazing overall. Um, there was a, I forget the name of a documentary on 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 fungi, you know, yeah. And, and that was just amazing, you know, I mean, how they communicate and, and the, you know, all that. Um, and there's so much of it under, you know, as we walk right over it, it it's really, really bizarre. But uh, so getting back to your film, um, how long was this production? So uh, that was another very, very incredible thing in filmmaking. Usually it's years and years. And what happened right. is I had the thought just before Christmas two years ago, and by March, we had already contacted uh, Kevin Day and uh, I was going to go out and gather the team from scratch, you know, like uh, which scientist, which expert, which device. And then Kevin Day told me that he already had a team together. They've been wanting to do something like this. Uh, they already had a couple of scientists on board. David Mason was on board. And so I thought, oh, well, that's easy. We'll do this film with you guys this first time. And so this made it very, very quick. By March, we already had kind of the core team together. And because David had already uh, the equipment in place, which was incredibly lucky, uh, we pretty much had it done by, what, April, I want to say, pre-production by July we were filming and by September we were in post and uh, yeah a year and a half later we we're done yeah so that's, that's that incredibly is fast lightning fast lightning fast I just want to shout out to we have Chris Lito um, he does a great um, YouTube he has a great YouTube channel he's a f f16 f16 pilot retired that has been debunking the debunkers he's doing a great job when it comes up, when it comes to the UFO topic. So I just wanted to say hi to him. And uh, so that is really incredible that you did it that quickly. And after looking at what you did, you must have had a pretty healthy budget. You don't have to get into numbers, but <laughs> you must have had a pretty good budget to do this film. Yeah, actually, it was uh, pretty expensive but uh it's my fault you know well first of all i have to say um david mason's equipment he, he'll tell you more uh we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment which yes. thank god mm -hmm. i didn't have to put up in this production but um i also wanted to uh do it make it very cinematic and the fact that um, with a high production value, as you saw just from the trailer, and also just to be in three different locations at the same time, think about, think about the number of crew members. We had about 10 cameras running at the same time all at once. Wow. And um, also we filmed uh, with the, the red uh, Gemini uh, red cameras. For those who know, these are very expensive cameras 
it just happened that the production company owned some. So we went, so then you have to, everything was top, top notch. I mean, you know, in terms of production, uh, but mm -hmm. you know what? I don't know. Like I, I, I spent the money myself, by the way, for those who don't know, um, I had a sponsor for the William Shatner piece, uh, but otherwise it was really from my own savings. But when I do something and I'm convinced that I should be doing it, I feel like I want to maximize all aspects of it, not just kind of throw a bunch of data together, a bunch of people together, but try, this is a film. And um, also part of the purpose was not only to bring validation to the subject scientifically, but also to try to bridge the gap to the mainstream. So that was another reason why I invited somebody like William Shatner, and I made it very cinematic-like, very film-like, as opposed to this, you know, very kind of raw, you know, uh, documentary style that you see out there normally. And it worked because I ended up, um, first of all, winning a lot of film festival awards. And, you know, these guys are mainstream. These guys aren't ufologists. They, I mean, they're not into UFOs necessarily. You know what I mean? So they're judging the film on the quality, on the storytelling. Are you making a, a compelling point? In your film you know does it hold together does it make sense does it look good from a production standpoint are you using the right you know equipment so on and so forth and for for a ufo film to win those types of awards tells me that the mainstream embraced it as well if that makes sense so um yeah so I, that ended up being a lot of dollars a lot yeah yeah i bet and William Shatner, that was one of the things I wanted to bring up. Um, I've always been a fan of, of William Shatner, and I still can't get over the fact that he's 90 years old and he hardly looks, he looks, you know, in his 60s, he could pass for his 60s and it's still as sharp as can be. Uh, what's he like um, after the cameras are off? Is he, is he a, a regular guy? Is he, is he easy to talk to? He's very, very easy to talk to. And actually the way... I used him in the film was not, I didn't want him to be, to host the show like in a typical way where he's outside the story. He's just reading a script and hosting, you know, I wanted to integrate him in the story. And so basically he was himself. And so uh, he's very, very fun, spontaneous. And, uh, you know, he loves this topic, but he also loves anything that the mysteries of of life, you know? So he's going to kind of take the subject and and kind of add to it and kind of bring it a, to, to another level, like a bigger perspective of life, you know, the mysteries of mm -hmm. life. So because of that, he's very easy, you know, to talk to because he's being himself, you know? So, yeah. uh, and even off camera before, when we were in the green room, we were talking, we were talking about animals and, and how, you know, speaking of communication, like how he can hear his dog and he communicates with his dog. He's very, very personable and very friendly. When, um, when he seemed to know of the details, I believe he knew the details of the Tic Tac, I, in a conversation with you. It was something like that. Maybe, maybe it wasn't that, but another one. But I was kind of impressed with the details he seemed to know. And did he get a briefing or did he look at these things on his own? No, actually I had sent him, uh, not questions, but kind of uh, speaking points. So he he's prepared. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, he didn't. he didn't really look at them. He didn't want to have a pre-interview or whatever discussion because he wanted to just be spontaneous. I'm like, yeah, but we have to stay and kind of follow a storyline. So, so I just wanted to know how much you know of the story. He, so what I'm trying to say is that I didn't brief him on anything. He didn't want to have any talking points. Uh, he just wanted to be there and just whatever comes out. So. So this means that he actually was um, familiar with that story. I was surprised myself. He knew about the UAP report. He knew about uh, the details of, of the Tic Tac incident. So everything you see in the film, 
none of it was prepared or scripted because he didn't want to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I, you know, in the, the second part of the show, I'll be talking more about, you know, the equipment and stuff like that. But I would imagine it's kind of like fishing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're out there with the, the line in the water and you're just waiting and waiting, waiting. So there's a lot of idle hours. Um, did you, did you see some things, but you just, that were not particularly convincing that you left out of the film or did we see everything? Oh no. Oh my God. We only took, like I said, we selected just a couple of, I mean, three or four things that we felt were compelling enough because we, there were so many correlations or so many, you know, things, okay, it's not a bird. It's not a plane. It's not this, it's not that. It's not, so what is it? So we only selected a few uh, examples that looked 100% anomalous. We don't know what they are, but they're 100% anomalous. There's still hundreds of hours to go through, uh, you know, to, to see what else is out there. So that's, you know, and that was the idea. But, you know, Martin, it was very difficult. Think, how many people do you know who go on expeditions and they come back? It's like we didn't see anything. Right. You know, and, and we were yep. and we were going to do this five days. Originally, we were going to do it 10 days. And then the budget was starting starting to get so crazy. I mm. said, why don't we do five days? And then if we don't have enough data or something, we can always extend. So uh, so in the even, but then even in the five days, the closer we got to the, you know, to the filming, the more, you know, it was getting expensive and crazy and i realized these guys had never worked together before they had the idea they had the team but they had never tried it before mm -hmm. you know we had never done it before from a production standpoint and put the two together it was i mean it was pretty like we were literally figuring things out as we went along and the first day you know of course software's not working power outages you know, messing up the calibration of the devices. Oh. I mean, all sorts of unseen wow. things. So the first two days were a wash. And I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, in production, every hour is like $10,000, $50,000. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And so, so I was really hoping for like one really, really, really strong, compelling piece of evidence that would be caught maybe captured from different angles with different correlations and things like that i, I would be happy um from a film uh, making st uh, standpoint uh, but we ended up with a lot more i mean and even with that uh so we were filming at night but the cameras everything all the devices were running 24 7. so they were capturing things that we didn't even know about does that make sense mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. why, like, as much as possible, we were trying to, during the filming, to catch up with what, you know, like, whatever was we could see. But we there was a lot that still we haven't even looked through. And so we were very lucky that the first uh, sightings um, were caught live, as you, you saw from, yeah. Uh, yeah, from David Altman, actually. Right. Tell yeah. You about that. yeah. He's pretty he's pretty proud of that, too. Yeah, of course. And he should be. He should be yeah. because, you know, that was pretty amazing because that particular one was caught live. So we were able to capture the action and everything that happened, you know, which is also incredibly lucky, you know. And uh, we were able to capture that one uh, object on, on two night vision, one regular camera and potentially from another angle. So, I mean, it was pretty... Yeah pretty lucky that we ended up with with just so much right that's excellent now i a lot of times people that i've talked to in the past they have something come out and then all of a sudden in their area saying oh well you know i saw something last year how do i get in touch with this person that did this film has any of that happened with you yeah some a few people have been sending me similar things, uh, some videos that are similar to uh, what we've captured. So, which is very, you know, um, helpful because that's the idea of the film. We're putting it out there for the scientific community, but also for the UFO community to collaborate, to tell us, 
hey, you know, we've seen this before, or uh, what about this? Does mine compare with yours? I mean, this is an investigation. This is an ongoing research, and that's the purpose of the film. And so I have had been contacted by folks, um, and, I, and I'm still encouraging people, please go to the website, etarinthesky.com, and, you know, keep sending us whatever you think is relevant. Uh, but there are two things that are in the film that I've yet to uh, have any comments on, um, you know, uh, anybody to tell me, to tell us, hey, we've seen this before. One is the raining Tic Tacs, you know, the, I mean, Tic Tacs, the raining objects falling in the water, which David Mason will tell you more about, but uh, very, very high speed uh, things falling in the water. Um, never seen anything like it before. And uh, by the way, for the first thing we look at is camera glitch. I mean, you know, these are experts. These are scientists. Uh, they're not going to just look at something and call it anomalous with that really. So it's not a camera glitch, you know. So, so David Mason will tell you more about this. That's a very, very unique footage that I've never seen before. And of course, the tear in the sky. Um, uh, which is that opening and closing, uh, revealing reflective objects. Um, you know, Matthew and Kevin Knuth uh, will tell you what they when they will come on your show. But uh, they shared more of this data at the recent scientific uh, SCU conference. You know, recently, um, and you know they're talking to hundreds of scientists in the in the room and remotely and you know, in the community, I, I have yet to um, hear of a, a uh, plausible explanation from anyone. So, so this is a, th so these two, I mean, to me are extremely, extremely compelling and uh, uh, very, very um, intriguing uh, anomalies that we've captured. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm having some, this is embarrassing. I'm having some trouble in the chat and just trying to get rid of some uh, comments. It's a, it's a bot, what they call a bot. Oh. There's a bot, bot in my thing, but hopefully I, I took care of it just now, just this very second. So um, let's see. This is, uh, this is a question someone wanted to know. Um, Regarding the ESP experiences, any attempts to remote view these events in a formal way? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, this film was very, we wanted to, to make it very hardcore science, you know, just measurable things. I am personally into remote viewing and this sort of stuff, but, um, you know, the scientists on the team uh, were very hardcore scientists. They just wanted to do it from that angle. And I agree because that angle has never been done before. You know, we've done, we've seen CE5, we've seen other types, things like this done before in ufology, but not what we've done. So I was okay with uh, just making this film just straight, you know, nuts and bolts science, science without any sort of um, you know, projection, remote viewing, or anything like that. Um, you know, in the future, we may experiment and do something else. In fact, I have some some kind of cool ideas um, how we could incorporate that scientifically. Uh, but for now, this film did not. We did not want to go there uh, on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, I have the both Davids, and I'd like to bring them both on. We could all. Uh, share the share the uh, screen and talk tonight, if that's all right with you. You ready? Yeah, absolutely. That'll all be right. great. Okay. So better be Dave. okay. Hello. <laughs> it better be okay. Here we are. <laughs> so we have, as you can see, their names: uh, David Mason and Dave Altman, and they were all part of this film. Dave Altman, first of all, you've uh, you've been a friend of the show for many years, and have actually gotten me a number of guests. I always appreciate that. And, hey, and this is the uh, first time I'm a guest. That's right. And and what, uh, David, you were the first one to see something there. And you saw two things, right, David? Um, I saw more than that. Um, the first night, let me, let me back up. So due to um, 
some mix-ups. I got on Catalina Island and realized that I didn't have anything to record the night vision from. <laughs> so um, the first two nights, you know, first night or two I was there, I was seeing things but couldn't film anything until yeah. we were able to figure out how to actually film it. Um, but I also saw something with the naked eye as well. And was it all nighttime sightings that you saw? No, the, um, there, there was one time that I saw something. I mean, I don't know what it was. Um, and it was just getting dusk. Um, so it wasn't completely completely dark yet. Uh-huh. And Dave, Ma David Mason, um, you are the guy behind all this amazing equipment. But I saw there's a shot in the film where you're uh, you're basically it's a daytime thing and you're 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 turning equipment, you know, during the day. So this was like 24 hours. Did you have people on shifts and things like that? Uh, we didn't have. We, yeah, we had shifts where people were um, people taking naps and people trying to be up on the rooftop to uh, make sure that we had eyes on the sky 24-7 uh, as best as we could. But most of our observations were more closely monitored in the evenings in, in, in darkness. Yeah. Do I see an oscilloscope in the back? Is that what that is? Something yeah. like that behind you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is a, uh, here, I'll just show you. This This is um, a Tektronix MDO4104D with a built-in 6 gigahertz spectrum analyzer. Um, oh, yeah. I have several of those. Yeah. 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 This, is, uh, <laughs> this, is, this is current product. It's $3,000. I'm just showing you. The kind of equipment that I use, I, I don't use cheap gear. And uh, yeah, that's that's what that is. <laughs> yeah. Um, so speaking of that, I, I mm -hmm. saw I saw the gear. It looked to me, Caroline mentioned hundreds of thousands. To me, it looked like a million dollars worth of equipment. I don't know. I don't know, you know, how to distinguish it, but it looked like really high end stuff. And can mm -hmm. you explain the different types of uh I guess, listening, watching type of devices. Sure. There are spectrum and all that. Sure. Um, well, you can see behind me uh, that transmitter, which you've seen in the movie. That's a triple spectrum light wave transmitter. It transmits in infrared and then visible spectrum and ultraviolet. There's some, ultra, um, some overlap. And what it does is it transmits frequency modulation and amplitude modulation of light. And so it could cover, you know, different areas. We can, we can assign different um, sounds to each one of these up up to about 200 kilohertz bandwidth and like we had on one transmitter we had my solo acoustic music uh, and on another transmitter we had carolyn's music we used our music not to self-promote but because we wanted to get around copyrights we didn't want anybody coming after us on it and then the other transmitter i was using a um a receiver that was just receiving light from outer space and just beaming it right back in case something came by and was transmitting some data, we could relay it back to them. And also what can be connected with these devices is I've got, uh, this is one of the inventions in the movie. It's a, a pair of night vision goggles that converts light to sound. And then you can see there's a laser that's ultraviolet. And then I can switch that to red or blend it. And this is also a, um, light that is uh, defocused so that way we don't point lasers at aircraft by mistake but this you we can convert what we see into sound so we can listen to aircraft we can listen to meteors we can listen to starlight and, and if we come into contact with something like a, a ufo we'll be able to um, receive that light and then transmit it back through this defocused laser because the assumption is if it's transmitting information, we're not going to understand it. It's going to go over our heads, but at least we can relay it back to them in a delayed form uh, and, and in a different spectrum, and maybe it'll provoke a response. So we're, we're going to show attempts of communication. And then the other uh, device is a pair of uh, photodial binoculars that um, have the same concept. It has a defocused um, red laser. And this this does the same thing, but it works in daylight, so we can do demodulation, listen to aircraft and things, and and identify objects in the sky, uh, you know, certainly the prosaic objects, and and be able to do that. Um, and then these devices can be connected to headphones or a recording device, or to that if you can see that that blue box behind me, which is the light wave transmitter console and modulator. That's that blue box uh, position behind me. And we can uh, 
interface it with that so whatever we received in the binoculars or the night vision, we can transmit it on that triple spectrum transmitter, assign it to whichever light source we want to use. And, and then the third device, which we didn't get a chance to show, was a FLIR camera that I re-engineered to have a new function. It's a thermal camera that doesn't produce images. It takes um, temperatures like body heat or very cold temperatures down to minus 80 Fahrenheit and converts it into sound also up to about 200 kilohertz. We can listen to modulated temperatures, cold temperatures even, and, and convert that. And, it's be, I, and the reason why I developed it was that I recorded some anomalous objects in the sky that were pulsing in temperature, in co very cold temperature. So I'm assuming there may be data encrypted within it. So we needed to have something to demodulate that or decode it. Um, wow. And that was a that was a really tough engineering job, you know. And I I know other FLIR engineers are going to look at that and go, well, how did he do that? Uh, well, I'm not going to tell you. So, but I yeah. did it. Well, I I was listening to a recent NPR podcast, mm -hmm. and they're talking mm -hmm. about animal senses, and animal mm -hmm. meaning the animal kingdom, all the way down through insects, and it's it's an amazing of the spectrum that you know in the ultraviolet some insects can see in the ultraviolet right and then it has to do with audio and all it's all connected it's quite amazing um, i think there's a lot of things that we we don't even detect or have perception right. on and and there's there's just so many gaps there that we're, we're having covered that's why we're trying to cover ultraviolet and deep and far infrared and long wave infrared and and try to work within that range hoping to capture something that might be active in it yeah i mean there may be things going on around us we have absolutely no idea and never have all through our history you know just because yep. we can't detect it in certain ways can't see it There's well some... yeah and i just want to interject when uh this all started with FLIR accidentally i had a um, a seventy thousand dollar thermal camera at my test lab in my company back in 2005 and i had the idea of taking it home and recording uh commercial jets i thought maybe it might have some limited application in long wave astrophotography and no one's really doing that and well the atmospheric inter, um, attenuation didn't allow for that long wave infrared to work with his camera and i thought well i'll just point it at the sky and record a commercial jet flying overhead it should look cool and so i was just trying to get some kicks and within about 10 minutes of using this camera there was uh two large anomalous objects that appeared in the monitor one was boomerang shaped, one was V-shaped, measuring minus 30 Fahrenheit according to the camera's calibrated temperature span. And I looked up and there was nothing up in the sky. And I continued to record these things. They didn't make any sound, they moved slow. They were not bird flocks. And uh, I, I, I just got super excited. I couldn't sleep that night. The next day I set up, tried to record stuff, couldn't find anything, just birds, bugs, and aircraft. And, and then a few months later, I decided to resume it, and then I started reporting all kinds of anomalous things. But in many cases, they're appearing in the thermal camera, and, and not just one, but several thermal cameras. And I, I look up in the sky, and I don't see anything. And then even if I use it at night and record something, and then I use the Gen 3 night vision goggles, nothing appears. So it's like they're appearing in a longer infrared spectrum, like long wave uh, 13,000, 14,000 nanometer wavelength, where where our night vision usually cuts off at about 1,100 nanometer. So how did you, and Caroline, how did you find each other? Oh, Caroline, you're, you're muted, Caroline. Hey, Martin, you might yeah. want to get the uh, chat. Yeah. So oh, again? Is yeah. it happening again? Yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Oh, you got it. Yeah. So um, as I mentioned, um, I was uh, looking when I stumbled on uh, Day, uh, Kevin Day, he told me that he had already spoken with David Mason and a couple of other scientists. They were all already part of his team. So that's why when I met David Mason and I saw what he was bringing to the table and the other scientists, I thought, you know, this is a no brainer. Uh, what makes this film uh, very, very different? Oh, it's already like the whole perspective and the whole approach is different. But in terms of instruments, it's not mm -hmm. that we just had multiple cameras, multiple night vision, multiple, you know, just the FLIR cameras. We had eight FLIR cameras. The expensive kind too, but yeah, like, like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fifty thousand dollars each. So we, we yeah. So, and, 
and you have to have large lenses. I mean, you have to be yeah. the um, and the, to be able to range, yeah, range down to minus 80 Fahrenheit and then be able to do 60 hertz frame rate. There's differences in FLIR cameras. I mean, you can buy consumer grade ones under $1,000, but they're not going to work well in, in video. They'll work great with still images. Yeah. Ahead, so, yeah, yeah, no worries. Uh, yeah, so 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 it's not that it was just those um, high quality equipment that he already had a multiple of each, actually. But on top of this, uh, and the triangulation and the different angles. On top of this, we had uh, original inventions that mm -hmm. you cannot buy. This is in David Mason's intelligence genius experience who brought this to the table. And I was like, I mean, I'm sold. There's no, um, you know, you can go out and buy, you know, expensively or expensive, but you can't buy an invention. And so that's the reason why this is extremely exciting. Even people in ufology who think they, they know about the instrument or they've seen this, they've seen that. Uh, we only covered a couple of his inventions in the film. Uh, like he was saying, there's more. Um, that makes it very, very, very uh, unique. And uh, very. I'm very hopeful because... Imagine what we're going to be doing next, you know, with these types of invention. The future of invest investigating ufology just opens up in a whole new way. Um, I have a, a question is he here from Jay Allen. Uh, from Skinwalker Ran Ranch, we heard there's a 1.6 gigahertz signal measured during odd events, basically L band for the tech savvy. Have David they tried to measure <laughs> that band during events? Have you tried? Uh, I guess this question is for you, Dave, David Mason. Yeah, it's a that's a difficult measurement to make because if you're using a broadband spectrum analyzer, you can create perturbations from like having your cell phone close by, even though that's 2.4 gigahertz. You can create heterodyne um, ghost signals within a spectrum analyzer where you could have what might appear at, at 1.6 gigahertz. Um, there's also uh, another thing that uh, people aren't aware of that's called GLONASS and it's uh, the Russian equivalent to a GPS system where it spans frequencies around that, that frequency band. Um, so we have to be cognizant that there could be other possible interferences that may be coming in from, at that frequency. You can look up GLONASS and, and Wikipedia, I think it shows the, uh, the frequencies. Um, and there's, it's hard to say whether or not that these objects are actually transmitting um, RF signals. I, I, I'm kind of the believer that RF technology to whatever is out there for higher intelligence is the equivalent of smoke signals or, or the Stone Age. Because when we're working with light, we are working in the multiple terahertz frequencies. When I men mentioned 800 terahertz, I was referring to the ultraviolet light wave transmitter. And when we look at our highest RF frequencies that are experimental at 500 gigahertz, which is not even used in commercial uh, applications, we're, we're really jumping that technology when we're using a light spectrum and it's still the electromagnetic spectrum. And I would think that anything of higher intelligence than us is already going to be in the light spectrum or in the gamma spectrum if they're using the electromagnetic spectrum for communication purposes. But when we're looking at RF signals, it's a very difficult thing to do because, you know, I've, I've worked on spectrum analyzers, designed circuits within them. I've done metrology work with them. And I know how easy it is to create a, uh, an error display where you overdrive its mixer. And, and then you can create all these little different signals that appear to be ghost frequencies that are at different spectrums. And, uh, and and you have to do pre-selecting, tuning, bandpass filtering. Uh, you have to test the mixer to find out what the maximum input signal is before it distorts and those kinds of things. And you have to quantitate it. Um, and very, uh, it's a difficult process to be, to come up with definitive uh, conclusions on if you're spanning and you see a carrier signal on a spectrum analyzer as to whether that is our technology or something from ET. Wow. I, I got to say something, uh, Mr. Mason. Mm -hmm. You certainly seem to know what the heck you're talking about. <laughs> well, thank you. It's good. It's, it's, to have I, you I work. I yeah. In my company, I, you know, I have a electronic test and measurement uh, engine. I mean, we we're now mostly just doing refurbishment and reset seller reselling uh, state of the art equipment. 
but in the past we did a lot of custom engineering on electronic test equipment and one of the things I can talk about is uh, I used to hot rod oscilloscopes and this was the Tektronix 2213 uh, 60 megahertz uh, dual channel scope and I had a request to make these 100 megahertz oscilloscopes so take it and hot rod it to a much higher rate and I was successful at doing that and I was able to certify that I had it at uh, you know proper bandwidth and uh, with only, I think, 2% overshoot and no perturbations, those kinds of things. Um, and so that's the kind of things I have a lot of experience on. So it was the way my mind works with thinking outside the box, you know, every day I have to do that at my company. So it, it, my mind will wander on to trying out new things and new technologies. Well, it sure sounds like they had the right person there. So this question, I, I like this question, but how the heck can they exist in a different light, light spectrum? It's about wave waves and wavelengths and, yeah. and vibrational, right? Yeah, it's a possibility that the reason why I wasn't able to see them is there's two things. It's either they can be cloaking, you know, if you want to say, you know, something from uh, science fiction, that maybe they're shifting their spectrum and how they do it, I don't know. I mean, you can put a lot of theory behind it. Uh, or they're very low mass and translucent and and just cold temperature for that reason and, and against a a background uh, sky i i don't know what what those answers are but i do know i have recorded them where i couldn't witness them in the clear camera and i didn't see them with gen 3 night vision and if anyone's ever used with gen 3 um, image intensifier style night vision uh, you nothing can hide i mean especially in the night sky and these things just don't show up especially if they're the larger uh, triangular or, or cylindrical objects that I've reported. Do you think they're solid objects, possibly? They could be. Um, but then, it, you know, what, what really defies everything is the, the low temperatures. And, and I use uh, scientific cameras that have passive temperature measurement capability. And I'm aware about how you can get anomalous temperatures based on the emissivity of the objects. Um, but nothing can really explain why they measure cold, because if they were shiny metallic objects, they're going to be reflecting the Earth's surface back to the camera like a mirror, so you'll get a higher temperature. And then if they are black-bodied craft, then uh, they're going to be uh, at extremely high altitudes. And if we do the calculations on altitude and temperature, and we know the camera's field of view, we can use trigonometry and um they often just measure out extremely large in size. There, there was one video I um, examined with, um, uh, this was uh, William Puckett from UFOs and W. He's a meteorologist. And uh, he, he said, well, given its temperature, which I think was about minus 75 Fahrenheit, that this object was at 90,000 feet altitude. And I, I did some trigonometry and I said, well, according to the camera field of view at 90,000 feet, this object was 2,200 feet across. Well, that's too big. I mean, not what would be that big and that cold? And so a lot of it, you can't explain it by the emissivity rule that happens, that, that exists with the thermography. And I, I don't know what these things are. I know that's not our craft. I know it's not drones. I know it's not black project aircraft. They're not flying them over my backyard. I mean, I, I flew a Cessna over my house uh, when I was taking flying lessons, and I know how it highly controlled this airspace is just in my neighborhood you know you they, if they're going to fly strange craft they're not going to be here they're going to be elsewhere and I, I don't know what these things are i certainly know it it's not us that has been an argument uh many times um if if the case is that these are experimental then why the heck would they be flying them over you know certain airspace like you're, yeah. you're mentioning right here yeah so yeah and you know, I mean, the 2,200 feet is not uncommon for what people have suggested in right. some of the uh, triangular crafts being, you know, uh, Peter Davenport stating that people were talking about mile or miles wide. Right. Um, during the Phoenix Lights. Um, all This is all very fascinating. So can I, um, can I, I mention something? Go ahead, Mark. Sure. Yeah, go right ahead. Go right ahead. No, but I wanted to uh, pick uh, David Mason's brain about... Um, you know, where could they exist in another spectrum? Is it possible? Because we know warping, I mean, warp is warping is possible. Is it, uh, is it possible that uh, they have a way to bend light in a, in a certain way 
uh, because we know light bending can happen. If they bend light in a certain way, then from our perspective, they look like all of a sudden they're no longer here or they can appear and disappear and exist in a different spectrum of light. What do you think about that? Well, that, that could correlate to the low temperature because of uh, ah. the, the wavelengths are, are just longer wavelengths. So if they're if it's like the equivalent of stretching the light or changing uh, the frequency of that light, um, it, it's theoretically possible. Uh, so that, that could be one of the explanations uh, as to why they're invisible even. And, yeah. and so and why they measure as cold, because if you do take uh, because a cold temperature is still the electromagnetic spectrum and it, it's just a lower energy uh, form of the spectrum. So, yeah, it all just about every theory we can throw at it, it is applicable. I mean, all, all we do know is that they do measure cold. Speaking of the cold, you know, when, a, when an aircraft, one of our commercial air, aircraft, for mm -hmm. instance, is at 30,000 feet, it can be 30 minus 30 on um, mm -hmm. uh, the temperature out there at 90,000 feet. Does it actually go that cold? Are you saying this is separately cold? Uh, oh, it goes, cold it goes colder. I've had some measured down to minus 80 Fahrenheit. And mm -hmm. a commercial jet is going to have a high um, um, emissivity or a low emissivity. It's very reflective. So every time I measure a commercial jet flying, flying overhead, whether it's at 30,000 feet or 35,000 or 7,500, most of them I see are, are around 7,500. They measure about plus 50 or even um, plus you know 30, somewhere in that range, because they're reflecting the heat of the Earth's surface back to the camera like a mirror. So I can't really get an accurate temperature of the commercial jet. So it just registers high, higher than it really is. And, and that's just because of the reflection. If it was a black bodied aircraft and it didn't have friction heat from uh, from uh, Air, air friction at velocity, then I would be able to get a more accurate uh, temperature measurement doing the passive uh, thermal camera measurement. But it, what makes this thing so unique is the fact that I get cold temperature measurements. It is no matter what you do with the scale, whether the craft is flat black or shiny metal, it can't explain why we have these cold temperatures. And, that, and that's what is, is really what makes this mystery deeper. Right. And this could be some type of science that we may discover along the way. And you may have some of the uh, first knowledge of it. It's it possible. could be. Uh, it's like when the first person that used the microscope and said, hey, there's little critters uh, swimming around in water. And uh, yeah. that, they were laughed at. They said, well, that can't exist. Uh, yeah. You know, we've had we've had a lot of people in science say some really dumb things that where they they said we couldn't go to the moon. We couldn't travel. Yeah. We couldn't fly. Uh, we even had a, a tech guy say, very famous tech guy, I'll uh, add, saying that the Apple iPhone uh, was going to be worthless because it didn't have a keyboard. Um, right. I remember so, that. Yeah. 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 I mean, obviously, somebody didn't have vision. And so we we're often held back by those people who pontificate their beliefs uh, and not really wanting to open their mind to the other possibilities that are out there. Right. I like the one that if you go faster than a mile a minute, your heart will stop. <laughs> they probably did that experiment after they pushed someone off a building and watched them fall down. Uh, and it was true. Uh, so Mary Grace always has great uh, questions. Could this type of communication with light be why our minds can receive ESP messages? Anyone want to tackle that in particular? That's an interesting idea. If something is maybe coming in through our eyes and sending us something to our head, but we're not acknowledging or, or cognizant of it, that's an interesting concept. And light yeah. is information. I mean, we're bombarded with light. Uh, we are emitting light. I mean, that's a proven fact. You can there's biophoton measurements coming out of the body, so we know that there's some sort of a light exchange. And uh, light is communication, like David was mentioning in the film, when they are mm -hmm. just uh, kind of, um, uh, what do you call David? Oh, my God. Yeah, they're, they're just when they're modulating. Or, yeah, or, they're modulating. They're modulating. Yeah, if they're changing intensity. And that's where I. I yeah. yeah well, with, go ahead. Like with UFOs, people have seen UFOs and they're, they're pulsing lights. And you know, I think that has to be information. It, it's not. 
they don't need lights for navigation or it's not their propulsion system. It has to be some something that they're putting out there in information. So they but can be I, seen. Yeah. Now, one of the things that she that the earlier question came in about light and ESP and how that could relate to our how our minds respond. I know that some people who have epileptic um, seizures can respond to strobes of light. Um, certain strobe frequencies can perpetuate it or, or instigate it to occur. And that research was done about 30 years ago. And so if you think about that, if that would trigger that, that there must be something that is received within our eyes, just the way the lights are modulated, that it would change the way we think if it affects people who have epilepsy. And also really we hear a lot about the connection between ESP and the pineal gland. And the pineal gland is what, you know, it absorbs light. Uh, so I wonder if there's a correlation there as well, that it absorbs light, whether your eyes are open or closed. It's just um, the brain is absorbing uh, light, whether you see it or not. It's just still absorbing and you're getting an ESP experience. There's, there's some research being done on that as well. Yeah, and also just the fact that bright lights tend to liven up people's lifestyles. They, they say that bright people light, that go through light. depression, if they feel depressed, you know, they, if bright lights are around them, they, there's, there's light therapy for people who are usually depressed in the winter months. So there's certainly right. a, a cognitive response to light. Hypnosis. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Hypnosis through, through, through light? Yeah, a lot of um, hypnotherapists use a flashing light. Huh. For hypnosis how about that uh so dave since dave Alt, david altman um yes just to get a question to you um how much time did you spend on that rooftop and was that your primary thing to do is to to search the skies was that is that was that your only job to do during this film <laughs> i wish <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh no i i did a lot of research historical research on the area um, of Catalina mm -hmm. and Laguna and, and just, the, you know, the whole area where the Nimitz encounter happened. Um, also, um, I carried a lot of equipment to the different <laughs> locations. Yeah. We, ha we had two separate hotel roofs that we were at um, that we filmed at. So, you know, did mm -hmm. that and a little bit of everything, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Multitask. Did you have to, did you have to haul that? equipment on golf carts is that what you ended up doing from the boat <sighs> so, or from the plane did you fly in there yeah so we had to take the ferry over okay so we had to there was only three of us and one of us couldn't carry anything so there was actually two of us that had to carry all the stuff onto the ferry off the ferry from the ferry to the hotel up and down the roofs three or four times we're talking, you know, 13 floors, 14 floors. It was it was brutal. It was really brutal. And the only unfortunate thing is, like, by the time I was done lugging that stuff up, I didn't want to look at UFOs anymore. I wanted to go to bed, you know. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. once you, once yeah. I saw something, that didn't matter anymore. Sleeping didn't yeah. matter. That, you that know, all I wanted to do was film. Right, right. Here's a, uh, a different uh, interesting question. Please discuss the question of whether or not the ETs might be aware of your project, your instrument, mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, first of all, we don't really know if these are ETs. I mean, my my personal feeling, I have no, we have no idea what they, whatever they are, we really don't know for sure what they are. That's my opinion, but uh, and, you know, you can challenge that any one of you, but I, I think it's likely that it's possible that it's ETs, but well, I don't know. But yeah. anyone want to tackle that question? Whether I, I can. Go ahead. I can. Um, you know, again, as I was saying, this film one, it was going to be very scientific, not symbol science, you know, but I personally have had so many experiences like that, that I know there's some sort of connection, communication or what have you. And so, you know, uh, before the film, as uh, I think you and I talked briefly, I I, I knew something was coming through. Like it was like I had the intuition to go out and make this film in this way. I had the intuition two years ago to call the film A Tear in the Sky, uh, which eventually we ended up capturing some sort of tear in the sky. So so I feel like um, 
whether it's ETs or some other higher intelligence out there, I personally felt from the beginning that there was some sort of guidance to go out and do it in this way with this at that location and things like that. And that's one of the reasons as much as it was expensive and very, very risky because this was never done before. This team had never done it before. We had never, never even met before. We never met before. Everybody was in a different parts of the country. We literally flew everybody and met for the first time. The production had never done anything like this before, triangulating in three locations. Plus COVID. Yeah, plus COVID. Oh, yeah. So it was very, very, very risky. And yet I could tell there was some sort of help or some sort of something. And so, so I couldn't bring it into the film, like I said, because that wasn't the angle and nobody was interested. But I personally was like in my hotel room. I was like, okay, guys, please something <laughs> show up, show up. Another uh, piece of uh, information that came through was that July 14th, I kept feeling that July 14 has to be July 14th. And so sure enough, that was the first sighting that came from Dave Altman uh, was July 14th. So I, what I'm saying is I kept feeling that they kind of knew whoever they are. Um, and in such a short time to be able to capture that amount of data in five days, um, hundreds of hours of data that we haven't gone through yet, but just the ones that we captured in the film, it's pretty incredible. I mean, think about that. And not only just any data, of course, there's the, the orbs and the, the, you know, the things that uh, um, were captured from Catalina, but very unusual anomalies, the ones that are raining down in the water and that, of course, that famous tear in the sky, you know, it, I mean, I don't know if this would have happened if there was really no connection to what we were trying to capture. That's my take. That's my theory. That's my opinion. It's not scientific. I'm just saying that's what I believe in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, interesting. Uh, here is another uh, question. I guess I direct this to you, uh, David Mason. Could it be the UFO's gravity field bending the light spectrum? Uh, yes, it could be. Uh, there could there could be some kind of a field if it's a gravity field that may be shifting the spectrum to make it long wave infrared, where I'm just barely detecting it. Um, and and these objects that I record, I have to have a a clear sky. It can be daytime or night, but as long as I have a uh, cloudless sky. And, and low humidity, because that's how you get the lower background temperature of, of the sky. Otherwise, um, if you're in a high humidity, warm environment, the larger cold objects get lost within that um, uh, that warmer environment because it, it just gets dominated by a higher temperature. I see. Uh, here's yes, a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish. Oh, I was just going to say I was I, I could say I could agree with that question that that's a possibility. I see. Okay. So, um, flares, here's one to the, to, yeah, this was flares right off of San Diego. Didn't they, didn't they, yeah, I think they confirm they, that they, was they, flares. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, a lot of people are seeing this in the news that there was a mass sighting off of San Diego. I believe it was last night. And, yeah. uh, that, I think that's pretty well confirmed that that was military flares. Um, so, uh, so we'll set that straight. Um, so, um, Tom King is also in chat now. He, uh, was very heavily involved in the, uh, Phoenix lights, um, mm -hmm. incident. So, uh, um, never so heard of him. questions. What's that? Never heard of Tom King. Yeah, that's right. So anyone in chat that would like to pose a question, please do put it in caps. Caroline, are you okay? Still hanging out with us? Yeah, sure. Did you want me to stay or? Oh yeah. Yeah. We'd love for you to stay on. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, this yeah, is all sure. fun. Uh, eventually, I'm going to get to the question about, um, you know, before the show's over, I want to get in the question um, of, of the anomaly and what has been discovered since then. We can save that for a little while longer. But Caroline, before that um, is answered, can you tell me a little bit about the title of the, the film and why you named it that? Yeah, so... 
a couple of years ago, I, I had when I had the idea of making the film, uh, I thought, okay, what do I call it? And, you know, a tear in the sky. I wanted something about an opening, some sort of, you know, portal or some, because my theory, my idea is that if there were, if there is a technology, whether it's ours or extraterrestrial, it doesn't matter uh, because we are observing anomalous behavior, you know, things flying, things appearing, disappearing, warping uh, space or bending light or doing these types of things. There's got to be something in the fabric of space time, it's, you know, fabric of space itself that allows such a thing to happen. And to me, these are specific points that, that people call hot spots. So, so I want to understand, for me, it's not just about UFOs. It's the mechanics of the universe. What is it in the universe, in our space, that allows such a technology to exist? And so because that's my focus, I want to focus on that portal potential, that tear, that wormhole <laughs> uh, idea. So that's why I called it a tear in the sky. And then at the end, sure enough, when we ended up discovering that discovery, it was mind blowing. Like what? Did we just record an actual opening in the sky? So uh, yeah, again, like I said, it's kind of everything came full circle with this film. It's, it's pretty incredible. And you had people like Matt, Matthew and Kevin, and you had a few other people there that are really um, in, incredible scientists. And has that particular um, phenomenon, whatever it was, is that a possibility of some new science discovery? Or what do we know about it at this point? Yeah, I'm glad you asked because um, so during the filming and after, you know, as, as the scientists kept looking uh, into the file, you know, the raw files, so people will see it in the film. But I mean, of course, the first thing we think about camera glitch, it's not a camera glitch because we have controls. We had just before, just after we have days, you know, same angle of the camera capturing, you know, the, the same frames. And exactly at that moment, you know, we see this opening. We have also correlation with radar. A radar is picking up on reflective objects. It's not picking up on radiation. It's not picking up on city lights. It's not picking up on star fields. It's picking up on objects. So how do you explain? And of course, they, they were, you know, they, they sh check with NASA, with solar flares, with maybe it's some sort of anomaly, even atmospheric anomaly. We're okay with that. It's just that across the board there is nothing that explains an opening and closing and actual reflective objects appearing so uh, like i was saying uh, dave um, um, kevin knuth and matthew were just uh, presented that that uh information to hundreds of scientists who were sitting in the room at the at the scu conference and also oh, yes. remotely yeah, and remotely as well. And I have been putting out this information as well. You know, we were saying any scientist, any atmosphere science <laughs> expert, anybody who has any sort of explanation, um, you know, let us know. And so also since then, now that's, that's different. Uh, since the film, uh, we also have been trying to get additional data, for example, data, uh, um, satellite imagery so uh, i have personally contacted friends of mine who have satellite um companies who you know who are looking trying to get that but also the team jeremy's been trying and the other team members have been trying to get um that sort of satellite imagery even through the freedom of information act and contacting you know people we know at the dod at uh, you know nasa you name it, like a, maybe a dozen uh, legitimate governmental and private organizations. And we finally, either we get answers such as we don't have the data, or we did get a response from uh, the reconnaissance uh, office saying it is classified, meaning they have satellite data uh, of, of the area, of, of the whole you know, whatever, except uh, the time and the date and time 
uh, that we were requesting, uh, they said, we have it, but you can't have it. It is classified. What does that mean? That's uh, That's been kind of like a question, you know, with these, con with the hearings, like um, I thought that was pretty interesting that they kept going back to whether it was classified or not, whether they'd have the ability to share it, um, you know, whether it would show their ways and means. But I mean, if their ways and means also showed that it was extraterrestrial, does that mean we would never know? Exactly. You know? But but if there was nothing, then they would just give us the imagery. Yeah, Why, yeah. So, um, it, of course, maybe there, it is a, you know, a black project or whatever. I mean, of course, uh, regardless, the point being, we captured something. That's mm -hmm. that. I mean, if anything, it validates just that one point. Yeah. You see? yeah. Whether it ends up being an NSA question or an extraterrestrial, regardless, this means that we captured something anomalous or that we cannot know more about which means we're on the right track we did capture something crazy. i think if, if it was something military we would know by now because the movie would not be up on amazon <laughs> yeah exactly that's what i'm saying so that's a good point as well and so i think the guys are appealing uh you know so this is kind of where we're at uh and because of that it even validates even more uh, that, and, and come on, like I haven't had one scientist come up with any reasonable explanation. I mean, and this was a, this was like a, a hole in what, like a hole in the atmosphere. It's a tear in the sky. So, so basically <laughs> it, it looked, so the way it's, Thanks, it's Dave. on camera, people will see it. It looks like a cloud. It looks like a cloud that opens and closes like that. But mm -hmm. the thing, what's bizarre is, is those objects. That's what, so when people look at it, you know, you may say, oh, maybe it's, it's uh, the city lights in the background or star, but it doesn't make sense because, because it's only showing through this one part of the frame. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. that's not a camera glitch. That's not, right. you know, if we see Starfield then we should see Starfield. like, why, <laughs> you know, plus, plus, when that um, cloud thing closes, you still have an object popping out of it. It's very, very clear on camera. You can see that. Actually, we have a few objects popping, but one of them is like super clear, just pops out. And so that's, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, Sorry, we're not ahead. saying it's this or that. We're not like wanting it to, be, of course, I want it to be a portal, but I'm not going to say it's a portal, you know, but the point being, it's pretty bizarre that not one credible scientist comes up with some sort of explanation like, like, yeah, we see these things in outer space or we've seen these before or this could be nothing. Nor and has it tried, to, anyone tried to debunk it. Not that I'm saying it's, it's any, I don't know. It. I mean, I don't know what it is. I'm not a scientist, you know? We, know. we don't know what it is. We're not claiming anything, but we're saying right, right. it's bizarre. Yeah. No one debunked it. No one's also... No, no legitimate organization has requested, you know, like uh, has any theory that could would make sense. Plus now with the FOIA, you know, letter rejection letter basically saying it's classified. Put the two and two together, it starts to kind of or that or it is classified and they know and they're laughing at us behind our backs. <laughs> you know, they, like they probably pretty, are, but but yeah. that but it, that doesn't change the fact. No, I, I know that we must be onto something because there it is classified. Does that make sense? Right, right. Uh Dave Mason, what did you think of of that anomaly with uh with all the because of your background with equipment and testing? Okay, so that uh, particular camera was uh, recorded with the UFO DAP camera, and that's owned by Carolyn Corey. But the data, I don't have copies of that data. That that's actually uh, um, was not under my, my examination. I have the FLIR videos and the 600 hours. I, I have the original, but I didn't have. So unfortunately, I don't have um, the data, so I really can't give an intelligent answer or comment on it. And as far as doing any kind of uh, forensics on that particular yeah. anomaly. Okay. Very good. Here's mm -hmm. another question that came up, and this kind of has to do with what we were talking about with the government with just a few minutes ago. Uh, when we confirm beyond a, a, any doubt that we're not alone and we figure out UAPs, um, what they are, would you trust our government who has been covering this for 
decades to make first contact. Um, does anybody want to tackle that in particular? I think no. it depends on. <laughs> I think it depends on what uh, individuals within government, because you have some individuals who would want to use it for empowerment and possibly abuse, and then other individuals who would like to use it for enlightenment and in improving our our knowledge base. And I mean, it's, if you think about it, if we recovered a um, some technology where we were able to reverse engineer it, if it fell into the wrong hands, uh, it could certainly be used in abusive ways. And, and if it fell in the right hands, it could be used in positive ways. And so I, I think we still have a long way to go as far as a, as a world society uh, for us to responsibly handle uh, new newly discovered technology. Uh, it's sort of like yeah. you know, giving the matches to the uh, to the to the monkeys, you know, and, and orangutans, you know, or if we gave them a machine gun, what would they do with it? Would they protect themselves right. or shoot each other? I had an. And would it even be first contact? Because from what I've learned, first contact was made a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had an astrophysicist on the show. I just love his his comment. He said that when he was speaking with his fellows at NASA um, privately about you know, the UFO topic and life elsewhere or whatever. Um, they kind of all agreed that if there's a society that can make it through the bottleneck of technology without blowing themselves up, that they'll be traveling mm -hmm. the stars and exploring. And I, I think we're, we're not too far away from the, that tipping point, whether we're going to, uh, you know, we always feel like we are anyway, we have all the nuclear warheads and, um, sure. you know, things we're doing to our environment and all that stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's tricky whether, we're yeah, whether we, and, yeah, whether we handle it responsibly. And, you know, that's, that's a big question. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, while we're on this subject, um, if anyone can tackle this, but do you think that if we did find that there's intelligent life out there, do you think it would bring our tribal senses together as a whole as a whole community more than it is now or do you think it would just be status quo anyone i think it would enhance us people would be super excited uh, and it would actually distract from all the world politics and we would probably set aside a lot of our differences and and there would come camaraderie um some alliances where we would recognize that there's something larger than us and bigger than us that we need to uh, uh, acknowledge the whole Ronald Reagan thing. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. No, I, I, I would hope so. I would hope so. That would be nice to nice to uh, to solve that. So moving forward, as far as um, this this movie, Caroline, um, do you have something else? Would you like to continue on this type of thing? I mean, it's a great theory to have this equipment and have scientists involved. Is there going to be have you considered a part two or or more uh, more of the same or something similar? Yeah, absolutely. Because of what we were able to accomplish in these five days. And like I said, getting more validation, more data um, showing, uh, proving or validating that we're on the right track. Uh, of course, we're going to have to continue. So I'm actually in pre-production right now. <laughs> Um, oh, really? the next yeah. one, yeah, 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 because, uh, yeah, I mean, how can we stop now, especially that we learn so much, you know, because that was never done before in this way, and with David's equipment, you know, everybody was was kind of trying to figure it out, and we still managed to get so much, so now moving forward, it, it will only get better, because we're going to pick and choose the equipment that worked, that didn't work, that we can change, enhance, um, record, triangulation, <laughs> yeah, triangulation, do it this the same way, uh, everything. And so uh, we're definitely going to continue because uh, it's. I think it's pretty incredible what we were able to accomplish already, especially when you hear the government, you know, uh, in the congressional hearings, telling us, uh, yeah, yeah, but we don't have any data. We, you know, we have those uh, 400 cases or 200 cases, I don't remember, but we don't have enough data. We don't. Have, 
and and we are civilians i mean you know we just go out with this equipment yes it is high end some of it is normal but a lot of it was a very high end equipment and in five days, we capture what we see you see in the film. But again, this is a film. We're not going to spend three hours putting all the scientific detail. You know, it's just enough to show this is anomalous because this, this, and that. And then behind it, there's still hundreds of hours of data. So we're civilians, and in five days, we're able to capture uh, that that amount of that quality and that type of data. So I'm. I'm thinking now the government, they can't be, and it's out in the public, it's more in the mainstream. I want to continue doing that to push the envelope, you know, to force, I mean, force, you don't force, but I mean, hopefully for them to come out and start saying, we have data. How could they not? With or at least, at least oh, legitimate data. Legitimate data, uh, you know, with all the radars and the satellites they have 24 seven with the multi-million dollar you know, <laughs> equipment yeah. they have. You can't, you know, we're civilians with that much data and they, you know, they can't, they can't come out and say we don't or we can't. So that's kind of what I'm hoping to do with this type of film, just push this whole disclosure thing forward. I listened to the, uh, the Zoom conversation of, of NASA discussing the other day, discussing um, their look into the UAP topic with a budget of, get this, are you ready? Yeah. One hundred thousand yeah. um, dollars. So I, I don't think, and they almost a few of the the people in the discussion almost sounded like they can they think they can solve it for whatever it is with with a, um, a hundred thousand. Yeah. Yes. That was the okay. budget. Hundred thousand. And I'm thinking about my okay. movie budget. <laughs> And what I spent, uh, I, I'm I thinking of one of Dave's pieces of equipment. Yeah, it's like yeah. one piece of David's equipment is a hundred thousand well, dollars. Not quite well, that, you but know, it maybe it may be, they may have access to very expensive equipment. I, I know they do. I mean, they have access to, but uh, but looking down, you know, uh, with satellites and things like that. But I don't know, you know, but even for a team of people, that just sounds like you know part of someone's salary, and you know, I mean, it, it sounds yeah. kind of silly to me but um but i i did like a few of the comments there were some comments that i thought was a little close-minded but the, you know i i can't remember the lead scientist basically said when someone asked them if they could be extraterrestrial he says um we have to be open to all ideas that's what science does science doesn't you know close anything out so i was i was at least you know glad that they were approaching it mostly in that direction that this is something to be learned they were saying they had no idea what it was. Um, and, you know, but it, um, I think one of them was saying that it probably has a scientific explanation because we find new science in the universe all the time. So, and perhaps they're right for some of it. Some of it might be science, you know, but when Dave Mason is talking about a 2200 foot triangle and, you know, boomerang object and things that people have reported over, you know, not not just recently. A lot of people say, "Well, those triangles are you know recent experimental projects and things like that." But um, but um, I talked to someone in 1977 that had an amazing large triangle sighting, and there's many more earlier than that. So if we had that technology then, I think we'd be using it um, long before now. Any any thoughts on that? Any one of you? Sure, I'll I'll take it. Uh yeah, and it seems like what I when I'm seeing a lot of information, uh, a lot of people like to throw out there. It's a the TR3B where you know right. it, it, it 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 gets overused. And the original yeah. TR3B came from one guy in the mid '80s claiming he came out of Area 51, and it, you know the story itself. If anybody worked there and then they disclosed their black project, uh, they'd be in jail. So uh, it That's just right. seemed like. It, it kind of falls on its face right from the get-go. So I, I'm really not buying off on it. And it seems like the anecdotal answer for every triangle, everybody likes to say the TR3B, so it's omnipresent, it's everywhere. This thing is just flying black project over every country <laughs> every night. And yeah. <laughs> and it, it just, it's being overused and there's no pr real provenance to support it. Uh, and, and examples of how that happens, if, if somebody says, a flying saucer landed and these purple, you know, headed people eaters came out and, and puts a story out there for fun. And then somebody copies that story 
and, and runs with it and it goes on another website and they embellish it and they give some animations to it. And eventually it becomes indoctrined as factual because everybody's talking about this, these purple headed people leaders in, um, in, in different websites. So anybody who looks at it says, well, it's over here, it's here, it must be factual. So that's just another part of the phenomenon. And that's happening in the tech industry. I, I hear it all the time. People say, we have satellites that can read newspaper from outer space. Well, anybody who says that, I know they never studied optical physics because if, if from outer space, when you're looking down through the mm -hmm. atmosphere, that limits to one arc second resolution. So you, you would see a newspaper, you could see that, but you would certainly not be able to resolve the print. And you don't have a large enough uh, uh, aperture or mirror or lens to be able to resolve that due to Dawes limit. Um, and, and so, and people will run with that. And the people who talk about that are usually not optical physicists or, or astrophysicists. They're people that really have never studied the sciences. And, and so they just go off what they read or what they heard. Right, right. Interesting. Uh, here's a, a question that a lot of people have asked over the years. Why the different UFO shapes? And someone, you know, further on said, asked if it's possible that some UFOs are biological. Hmm. Anything's Any possible. Yeah. 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 Anything's Literally. possible. Yeah. Everything speculation. I could come up with a hundred different reasons why I think it could be a different shape, but everything's skeptical. And about about the the biological thing, I've been looking into a lot of those old cases of the the manta rays that are yep. they look gelatinous. And mm -hmm. um, there's also a case that I ran into from I think it was the fifties or sixties, and I believe it was a school in Spain. And it was um, it had to do with angel hair, where oh, yeah. uh, they saw a disc. And for people that don't know what angel hair is, it's uh, a gelatinous substance that appears to fall from the sky after a UFO sighting. And it kind of looks like frog, like amphibian eggs, kind of. Um, hmm. It hits the ground, but it it dissolves very quickly. But the 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 the, the one report I was looking at. The guy who who saw the UFO and found the samples of the angel hair was a biologist. It was he was at the, the school when it happened, and he ran. He scooped it, ran right into the lab, and he found in the angel hair what what looks like a small creature under a microscope, and it was biological. And it, I think he said they it, it said it, it was some type of to compare it to something that was on earth, some type of like crab or something, you know? So, I mean, who the, who knows, man? I mean, that one just makes me scratch my head because the angel hair stuff has been going on forever. doesn't really happen much anymore, but in the past, I mean, Charles Fort reported on that stuff way back then. So right. it, it's yeah, just, it's another head scratcher. It's, it's like, you're telling me there's a, living entity, biological entity inside the angel hair. And why has nobody discussed that since? It's crazy. I do remember the case of when someone scooped that. I did I did hear about that. And uh, yeah, it makes you kind of wonder of the, the panspermia account where, you know, who Makes knows? me think about octopus. Yeah, yeah, they're so intelligent mm -hmm. and they look, they're definitely alien. <laughs> yeah. They certainly look at, at the cuttlefish too. Don't, but even the like, cuttlefish. just right. even in a small amount of samples that we captured in this film, you can see that it's not one thing because each anomaly is an anomaly, but it, it looks very different. It behaves different. So I think that's part of the problem with this phenomenon. It's, it's that it's not just one thing. Some of it is military. Some of it is human. Some of it is biological. Some of it is a combination. Because I've seen things that morph from light to, to matter to back to light. What is that? You know, so I think that's what, you know, you can't come to one conclusion. It's, it's a multitude of things all under the same roof. Yes, earlier I talked about a friend of mine that had an amazing UFO sighting, and I said he he said that he could care less about it. I don't know if you recalled when I said that, um, but he also said that this thing, this box-shaped UFO with lights flashing all along it, shot up to the sky, and then it burst into five lights, and then the five lights had a formation; they were blinking back and forth, 
and shot off to, in a formation when a uh, a fighter jet came to, you know, go wow. through. I mean, what an amazing sighting. But that is like the ultimate sighting. If he, had seen, if he would have seen beings, it would have made it 100%. <laughs> but, I mean, you talk about changing. I mean, that thing changed from, he said it looked like a square, like a rectangular box. And then it burst into just lights. And, you know, yeah. Charles Halt said the same thing at the Rendlesham Forest. Mm -hmm. And uh, he also said five lights. You know, I mean, whether there's any tie there or not. But I, I told Charles about that particular um, sighting and he he couldn't believe it he said that's just what i saw turn into five lights you know mm -hmm. so yeah it's such a mystery and the more you dig into the topic that's why i love it so much the more you dig into it the more of the mystery you cover that there's more to uncover you know and yeah. uh so it just keeps it it keeps me uh keeps me at it all the time uh now over 10 years doing this so uh <laughs> really enjoying it um so um, you, Dave, you had, everyone here has had a, a UFO sighting, which I think is, mm -hmm. uh, quite amazing really when you think about it, but Dave Mason, you, um, you started filming these things. Have you seen, have you had like UFO sightings as well, other than what you've been filming? Like, have you personally seen yes. things yeah. and have you seen things without equipment? Yes, I have. Uh, there was an evening, and I, I forgot the year. It was, I think it was 96 or 97. I saw a large black, uh, it, it looked like a, um, you know, like a stealth bomber. And it flew overhead uh, over my house, and it was uh, only at about maybe three, 400 feet altitude. Very, It was very large, moved slow. It had two glowing lights on it, which when I looked at it, I thought they were some kind of afterburner, but it didn't make any sound and it flew overhead and it, it left me thinking it was our technology. But then when I thought about it, how did that thing fly over so low, not make a sound and went directly overhead? And, and the, what I was looking for at the time, I remember it was August 13th, because that's when you have the peak uh, meteor showers uh, and in the summer months. So I was just out to watch meteors. And it's, it was one of those things where you see it and you're kind of thinking, did I really see it? Because it, your mind just doesn't sort it right. And that was in uh, 96, 97. And then in 2006, there were some bright uh, objects in daylight that were uh, just south of my house that were formed in the sky. And uh, they were, I guess you call them flotillas or they were, they were a cluster of lights. And this was in the afternoon, the sunny day. And I, I recall grabbing some binoculars and looking and I could see one of them was elongated, but they weren't balloons and they were some sort of luminous sources. And then I grabbed my large uh, Mead 12 inch telescope. I thought, well, I'm gonna get this thing and try to zoom in and get a really good view. And by the time I had that telescope set up, the objects were gone. So I really couldn't <laughs> get a view of it. But yeah, definitely yeah, I've, I've witnessed it. I've got friends who, and family who have witnessed a lot of unusual objects on their own uh, reports, but uh, definitely more more so I pick up on the uh, thermal cameras, which like again it, it was discovered by accident. And uh, what was also interesting is, as I was recording over the years, there were certain years where I got nothing. I mean, where I would record get birds, bugs, and aircraft, and it would get very frustrating where you wouldn't be able to record anything, and you spend hours of reviewing. And there were some years where I just skipped it because I thought that the phenomenon was done. And mm -hmm. in 2016, I came back at it uh, with a lot uh, more time and found out I was missing a lot of activity. And there were some very anomalous things that were following commercial jets and in front of commercial jets, which I, I recorded on, on FLIR. Interesting. So, well, so you know, you, this, go ahead, uh, Dave. Uh, I Dave. was, I just wanted to answer, um, Greg O'Brien's question, and he asked if anybody experienced the hitchhiker effect after the film. Um, I personally didn't, but I did see th total of three things that I could not explain when I got home. There were lights and objects in the sky. What they were, I don't know. Um, I didn't have any poltergeist stuff, unfortunately, or anything like that. But um, I, I did see some things when I got home that I had never seen in the area before. Anyone else? Um, have nothing, 
nothing paranormal uh, other than that the excitement of, of what we did I've, I've been developing new technology things that I can't share right now uh, they'll be used in, in future projects uh, but they're certainly inspired um, but yeah no, I can't say that I've had anything anomalous happen yeah me neither I, I was so focused on finishing the film <laughs> that uh, that that was my main concern. I, if, if something happened, I definitely didn't notice it. I'm like, let's get this <laughs> film done. <laughs> oh, I bet. Yeah, I mean, for the person that has never been involved in in filmmaking, it is you know I, I hear from you know a couple of friends that I have that that's what they do for work. And uh, James Fox and and Dean Alioto talking to both of them and what's involved is just mind blowing and the hours and hours and hours and hours. Uh, when James Fox was doing, you know, the phenomenon, he, he, I forget how many hours he told me that he had filmed, uh, something like 900 hours or something <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, you know, maybe it wasn't that many, but it was a lot. And so that, but no one knows how much work goes into it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and Caroline, you're, you're behind the driver's seat in this thing all the way through. And for you to get that done in a, a year and a half is really, uh, very impressive, actually. Yeah, so. it's, that's why I feel that we were some sort of supported or something was happening because uh, it was incredibly fast. Uh, the way also we count not just so much the hours because we're literally we're working around the clock sometimes, but also the number of edits. And oh, yeah. uh, and we also had so many cameras running at the same time. So for, for people to know who know this in post production, every camera is on one track. So when you have ten cameras, it's 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 just so much information. And to edit it together, this was very 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 difficult to edit together. To make it, you know, at the end you just watch it as one seamless story, but every second of the film, you know, needs to kind of be picked from this place and that place, and the, you know, so the synchronizing everything and uh, from a, from a technical point of view, it's is very challenging. So we have about, uh, I think we ended up with something like almost three thousand edits. That's that's oh my goodness, it's crazy. And we're yeah. meaning cuts or this or inserts or you know every little thing you do when you cut from camera to camera you know is is a so that's a that's a, a, a huge amount. Well, I never thought about the ten cameras you had going. That's uh, there's no. They had ten. I had one. There. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that's it. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. And Caroline, thank you for hanging in the whole way through. I appreciate that. No, that was awesome. You know, I really, I really enjoy your podcast. I've met you at other conferences, so I really, really appreciate yes. your work as well. And so, thanks for the opportunity. And I hope people will uh, will be encouraged to to watch this film. Thanks to you. Yes, thank you very much. And right down in the show notes and down in the text, you will find um, how to watch that. Thank you all. Thank Take you. Care, and everyone. also, one last thing: I posted the angel hair case I was talking about on Twitter. Excellent. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Thank you, Mason. And thank you, Dave Altman. All right, everyone. We will be back uh, next week and we'll be back with uh, Chris Rakowski from Canada. Should be a great show. Thank you all. And remember to keep your eyes to the sky. <laughs>